came to change my change. So today we are going to talk about the physiology of the menstrual cycle. Uh, and mainly we are going to focus on the physiological findings that are usually reported as pathological findings. That's why it's titled, not always a, uh, pathological, sometimes it's just physiological. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to, okay. So most of the time as sonographers, we now have a tendency of just getting the patient, put the patient on the bed and then we start scanning. But can you just stop a moment? Do you know the patient that you're scanning? And in knowing the patient, I don't mean knowing their name, just their name, that's not enough. Do you know the history of the patient? Do you know their story? Uh, so there's actually this saying that say, before you examine the board of a patient, the patient to learn his story. For once you learn his story, you also come to know his body. So we can never stress enough how uh, patient history is important in sonography. Uh, actually, the golden rule is never scan a patient that you do not know. So uh, it is important that you take um, patient history. And part of this patient history includes, includes the menstrual cycle. So we're going to talk briefly about the physiology of the menstrual cycle. So basically the menstrual cycle is composed of two cycles. We have the, the ovarian cycle, then we also have got the uterine cycle. In the ovarian cycle, we have three phases. The first one is the follicular phase, which happens before ovulation. Therefore, sometimes it, call, it is called the pre-ovulatory phase. Then we have our ovulation. And lastly, we have our luteal phase, which happens post-ovulation. So it's also called post-ovulatory phase. Then in the uterine cycle, we have got uh, menstruation, we've got uh, the proliferative phase, which happens uh, after menstruation. So it is also called postmenstrual phase and the secretory phase, which happens before menstruation. Therefore, it is also called the premenstrual cycle. So for the um, uterine cycle, this is happening in the endometrium. The myometrium is not um, affected, does not participate in uh, the uterine cycle when we're talking about the menstrual cycle. So the, menstrual, the menstruation in the proliferative phase of the uterine cycle coincides with the follicular phase of the um, ovarian cycle. And this happens before ovulation. Then after ovulation, we have the secretory phase in the uterine cycle, which coincides with the luteal phase in the ovarian cycle. Uh, so just to talk um, about the follicular phase in the ovarian cycle. So what happens is, um, when uh, luteinizing hormone is released from the anterior pituitary gland, um, it uh, stimulates uh, accelerated uh, growth of primary follicles. So the follicles start to grow and they are enlarged and they are now termed the premodal follicles. So uh, time is the level of SSH surpasses uh, luteinizing hormone. There is a growth of actually about six to 10 primary follicles uh, that are selected and this compete for dominance. These are developed layers of granulosa cells that accept, uh, express uh, receptors for luteinizing hormone and then the thicker cells that uh, express, that, uh, express uh, receptors for estrogen and progesterone. So there's accelerated growth of these primary follicles into what are called vesicular follicles. Then after a week or more, uh, one follicle is selected. As I mentioned earlier, that they, um, they compete for development. So one follicle outgrows the other and the rest of the follicles regresses in a process called atresia. Uh, then the selected uh, follicle, which is outgrown the other, which is also called the dominant follicle, increases in size and then uh, mature to become a mature follicle. Then it undergoes meiotic division, where it gives rise to two cells, the bigger one, which is called the secondary oocyte, which is now our um, ovum, which will be ovulated. Then the smaller one, which is called the polar body, which will eventually regress. So just to, to mention about this follicular phase, there are actually wave patterns of follicular genesis um, if you understand 
uh, when we're talking about the menstrual cycle, mostly we talk about the ideal 28-day cycle, but it's not every woman who has a 28-day cycle. And this comes about, this difference in the length of cycle comes about um, from the wave of follicular genesis. So the luteal phase actually of the ovarian cycle is um, constant. The number of days for the luteal uh, phase is constant, which is 14 days. What differs is the follicular um, phase. So in a normal 28 day cycle or in the ideal 28 day cycle, there are two or three waves of follicles. What happens is if we have a two wave uh, follicular pattern, it means that the first wave of follicles are going to be ovulated, which means we are not going to release an ovum in the first wave. And ovulation is going to happen in the second wave. The same happens in the three wave five, um, pattern. The first two waves are unovulated, then the um, final third wave is ovulated. So it has been discovered that there are actually women who've got six phases, some have got five phases. So for example, for the five wave um, pattern, the first four waves are unovulated, we only get ovulation on the fifth phase. So that's it. that is how we get variability in cycle length uh, due to this uh, waves of follicular genesis. So some people, some women have got a longer follicular phase, some have got, have got a shorter follicular phase, and this has been found to be normally a normal physiological process. So um, in each phase, we've got a group of antral follicles with synchronous growth. I think I have uh, explained it, this. One follicle grows to a larger diameter, which is called the um, dominant follicle of uh, that group. So these new waves, they appear at regular intervals within cycle. And each wave is preceded by a small increase in FSH. So within each cycle, as I mentioned, the earlier waves are unovulated, whereas the final air wave ends with ovul ovulation. So in the unovulated waves, these follicles actually grow to a certain maximal diameter and then uh, regresses, right? So in, um, they've been classified as minor. These are ovulation waves. They've been classified as man minor if our antral follicles are small, that is less than eight millimeters, or major if their largest follicles uh, develop up to about um, a diameter of greater than 10 millimeters. Uh, so this explains the natural history this uh, explains the um, difference in the, um, in the um, menstrual cycles. And you have to take note that sometimes a large and ovulated follicle may begin growth within the luteal phase and persist into the next men menstrual cycle. Uh, take note that I've highlighted persist into the next menstrual cycle. You will see how it comes about when you're now talking about ovarian cysts. Then we move on to our ovulation phase, which happens um, at day 14, if we're looking at a 28-day cycle. So a few days before ovulation, um, the follicles start to swell. Then it is a center, a protruding center, which is called the stigma, right? When we have got the stage of the luteinizing hormone, which happens just before ovulation, um, the release of estrogen from the follicle then degrades um, the cells at this stigma creating a wall. Through this wall is where our secondary oocyte will live and the end ovulation is taking place. So if fertilization um, takes place, we then get our mature ovum. Over, if there is no uh, fertilization, it eventually degenerates. So after we've released our ovum, we are now at the luteal phase. So, the granulosa cells, which were surrounding the ovum and the thicker cells, now develop into lutein cells. And these cells are filled with lipid components, which gives them the yellow appearance. And this total mass is what we call the corpus uh, luteum. So there's new angiogenesis uh, at the wall of the corpus luteum, which facilitates its endocrine gland. So a corpus luteum is actually an endocrine gland which re uh, releases, which produces progesterone. So um, the role of progesterone is to inhibit the release of FSH and release of luteinizing hormone by the pituitary gland, sort of a negative effect. So with time, 
the concentration of this uh, FSH and LH4s, because it's being inhibited by the progesterone, which is produced by our copper lutium. And over time, the copper lutium um, eventually gives you more. Uh, so the falling of these levels of progesterone then triggers our uh, menstruation into the in the um, uterine cycle. So, okay, just to mention about the um, life of the corpus luteum, it actually uh, co forms the um, hemorrhagic corpus luteum in the first uh, phase. So when the ovum is released, there is re certain release of pressure as well releasing the ovum. So then it becomes folded, right? Because the uh, pressure inside is, it's been released. And sometimes it, uh, more, it actually bleeds inside, then eventually forms a um, blood clot. And this stage takes about three days before it then eventually changes into the corpus luteum. We've talked about the capillaries. So this capillaries that grows uh, around the walls of the um, corpus luteum, they allow gradual absorption of the blood clot, which has been formed from the hemorrhaging of the corpus luteum. So this is just a pictorial presentation of our ovarian cycle, where we mentioned that we've got our flu few follicles that develop in the follicular um, phase and they compete for dominance. One follicle outgrows the other and becomes the dominant follicle, which eventually becomes a mature follicle. And then our cells at the stigma are degraded and they create a hole where we have our ovum, which is liberated here. Yeah. And then it forms our corpus luteum, which will eventually form a corpus albicans. This is just the degeneration process of the um, corpus luteum. Then we move on to our uterine cycle, which starts with the menstrual phase. So we said our corpus luteum is degenerated, and this has decreased the level of progesterone and uh, estrogen. So due to this, uh, to this uh, decrease in the levels of progesterone on antiestrogen, we have temporal spasm of the spiral arteries in the endometrium, in the functional layer of the endometrium, and this leads to ischemia and necrosis. So, when now this um, spasm is uh, spasm is relieved, blood escapes uh, from the damaged capillaries, then it flows with the necrosed endometrium, which gives us menses. But this process does not happen like along the whole of the endometrium all at once. Otherwise, we would have our menstrual menstruation just one day. But um, the endometrium, the necrosis and the ischemia is happens gradually and starts from the um, basal layer of the um, endometrium, and it lasts, lasts about three to five days. So at the end of this phase, because we've shaded off the functionalist layer of the endometrium, we're only left with the basal layer our endometrium will be approximately 0 0.5 millimeters thick. Then there's a phase which is between the um, menstruation and the proliferative phase of the uterine cycle, which is called the regeneration phase or sort of repairing of our endometrium. So this happens between day four to day six, where we are regenerating our certain vessel so that it can um, prepare for the next uh, menstrual cycle. So, um, the epithelium of the fundi of the glands start to proliferate to complete the epithelial lining. Um, and it reaches a thickness of approximately two millimeters and it's, it's uh, flat. The glands are straight and narrow and they contain um, lymphocytes and spindle-shaped connective tissue cells. Then it takes us to our proliferative phase, which happens from day seven to day 15. Take note, we're taking, uh, talking about the 28-day cycle. So this happens from uh, day seven to day 15. And as mentioned earlier, it corresponds to the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. So this is under the control of estrogen, which is uh, secreted by our um, ovarian graphene follicle. Remember, this is corresponding to the follicular uh, phase. So we've got these um, follicles which are developing in the ovaries, and uh, these are the ones which are secreting the estrogen. So this estrogen, uh, assist in proliferation of the endometrium. And at this stage, the endometrium increases in thickness, which is approximately four millimeters. And now its lining is cuboidal. 
their gland, the uterine glands are now straight, long, and widely separated, but they have no olitro secretion, which is uh, different from the secretory phase where the glands are now secreted. So the secretory phase now happens from day 16 to day 28 and corresponds to the ritual phase of the ovarian cycle. This is now under the control of progesterone. So our endometrium is now thick. It is approximately 10 millimeters. It is now soft and um, velvet. And uh, at the end of this cycle, we can actually differentiate this, um, the endometrium into three different layers or three different strata. We've got the um, superficial strata, which is called the stratum compactum, and this contains the length of the uterine glands. Then we've got the middle one, which is called the um, stratum spongiosum, and this contains the body of the um, bodies of the uterine glands. Then deep, we have got the stratum basale, um, which contains for the, the fundi of the uterine glands. As, as we mentioned earlier, this is responsible for regeneration after the uh, endometrium is shut. So the uterine glands, which are in this endometrium, they are tortuous in their spiral and they are loaded with secretion, which is now rich in uh, mucin and glycogen. Remember, we're pre preparing for possible pregnancy. So that's why our uh, endometrium is now rich in uh, mucin and glycogen to sustain early pregnancy in case uh, fertilization takes place. So basically, the endometrium has got two types of arteries. Uh, we've got the short, straight basal arteries, which are limited to the basal layer of the endometria. Then we've got the long superficial spiral arteries, which um, extend all the way to certain compact which is the functional layer of the endometria. So this is also a pictorial view uh, showing us the uterine cycle. While in the early proliferative phase, our endometrium is not that thick. So we've got our myometrium here, we've got our basal layer, and we've got our functionalist layer. So as you can note from this, the basal layer is not changing in its size and thickness. The only layer which is affected is the functionalist layer, which is at its thickest during the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. Uh, this is a combination of both the ovarian cycle and the different uh, levels of hormones, uh, both the uh, anterior pituitary hormones, that is luteinizing hormone then FSH, then the ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Uh, so as you can see here, our progesterone is now rising, which is released by the corpus luteum, because this is not the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. So this is our endometrium, which has shed during menstruation and is at its thinnest point uh, when we are now starting the um, proliferative phase. It increases its thickness up to its maximum thickness in the secretory phase. And when the corpus luteum degenerates and the levels of progesterone falls down, we have necrosis of these spiral arteries. Uh, then we shed off our endometrium and the next cycle begins. So as, we, as I mentioned earlier, the endometrium which participates in the menstrual phase is the upper endometrium, that is the uterine endometrium. The endocervix does not participate in a menstrual cycle, but however, there are some changes that also happens during this menstrual cycle. So during proliferative phase, the secretions of the mucosa cells of the endocervix becomes thin and watery, thin watery and alkaline. So during ovulation, the cervical mucus is thinnest and its elasticity is maximum. So it actually produces what they call a thin pattern, which is a thin core test that they use uh, to test ovulation. So when it's spread on a glass slide and allowed to dry, to dry it produces um, a thin like pattern. They call it a thin test. So this can actually be used to determine whether ovulation is taking place or the um, cycle was an ovulated. So if ovulation is taken place, we should see this thin pattern during the proliferative phase and it should disappear in the secretory phase, right? But if this pain pattern uh, persists throughout the cycle, it indicates that uh, no ovulation has taken place. 
Then during uh, secretory phase, under the influence of progestion, the secretion of the um, cervix decreases in quantity and they become um, thick and tenacious and the fan pattern is lost. So this actually make a plug that prevent further entry of sperms uh, through the cervical canal. Um, that now that we've talked about the physiology that happens during the normal cycle, uh, we want to look into the ultrasound appearances. What are we expecting at different stages of uh, menstrual cycle? What are the normal findings that we expect to see? So let's start with the um, endometrium, just a basic run, uh, rundown. During our menstrual cycle, that is day one to day four, our endometrium is a hyperechoic line, which is measuring uh, one to two to four centimeters. Then during the early proliferative phase from day five to day 13, it is still a hyperechoic line, but it's now measuring five to seven millimeters. Then on the late uh, proliferative phase, it gives us a trilaminar appearance where we've got our hypoechoic functional layer and hyperechoic basal layer. Then we've got the hyperechoic layer at the center, which is representing overlapping of the opposite uh, layers of the endometrium. And the thickness is approximately less than 11 millimeters. Then during the secretory phase, which is day 16 to day 28, the endometrium is now thickened. Uh, and it's hyperechoic, and it can measure up to 16 millimeters. So this is just an ultrasound image showing us our endometrium during the menstrual phase with a thickness of approximately 0 0.3 centimeters. So we can see our endometrium appears as a uh, thin hyperechoic hyper uh, strip. Then this is a pro proliferative phase where we said we've got our trilamine appearance the hyperechoic basal layer, the hypoechoic functional layer. Then this is the interface of the two opposed layers and another um, hypoechoic functional layer and the basal layer, which is hyperechoic, which gives it the trilaminar appearance. And we said during the secretory phase, our endometrium is hyperechoic, is thickened, as you can see, measuring approximately 1.2 centimeters uh, in this instance. And you can see that the uh, cervix is not affected in all these images, okay? We're only seeing the upper endometrium in the uterine uh, body and fundus being affected. Uh, and this is now combining the changes which are happening in the uterus and the changes which are happening in the ovary. So this is during our early proliferative phase or just after menstruation, We've got our hyperechoic endometrium. Then in the ovary, remember it coincides with the follicular phase. So we've got follicles which are now starting to develop. So we expect to see a few follicles in the ovary is uh, indicated here, even in this pictorial diagram. Then we move on to our um, proliferative phase, which is almost closer to our late proliferative phase where we have our trilaminar appearance of the endometrium. And now, in the ovary, because we're almost towards um, ovulation time, there's that one follicle which has outgrown the other. So we expect to see our dominant follicle in the ovary as seen in this image. And in um, secretory phase, our oh, endometrium is now thickest uh, and hyperechoic here. Yeah. So we have ovulation has taken place. So we have released our ovum. So we now have got our corpus luteum which is seen here. This is still hemorrhage corpus luteum, as you can see low level internal echoes in this cystic structure, which is in our ovary. Um, then moving on to changes which are happening in the ovary. These are just, this is a follicular phase where we can see our few follicles developing. Uh, all these few follicles developing in our follicular phase, few follicles developing. And as you can see, there's actually one which is starting to outgrow the earth. Right. Then the one is outgrown the other. All the other follicles are regressing, and we've got our dominant follicle, which is uh, during our follicular phase. And this is now our luteal phase. Where we've got our corpus luteum. Remember, we said um, the pressure is uh, reduced due to the release of the ovum, and the um, 
walls become now folded, folded and we've got our thickened wall and there's new angiogenesis that you can see increased blood flow in the flow of our corpus luteum and some hemorrhage inside. This is also showing a corpus luteum with our folded walls. And um, so the corpus luteum, we expect it to be a size which is lesser than the dominant follicle. Because remember, we've re uh, released the ovum and we've reduced press, um, pressure inside this um, corpus luteum. So it is actually reduced in size. So its size is uh, expected to be below the size of the dominant follicle. These are just uh, uh, pictures of the corpus luteum. So in this case, we've got our hemorrhagic corpus luteum with this fishnet appearance, which is hemorrhage inside the fishnet appearance. Uh, then we also have got our corpus luteum here. Now in this case, we've got a retracted plot in the corpus luteum. And in some instances, this can actually be mistaken as um, a complex ovarian cyst where the retracted plot is uh, thought to be a solid component of an ovarian cyst. But how you differentiate it from um, a solid nodule in an ovarian cyst is that it forms, due to retraction, it forms these concave borders. And when you put on color Doppler, because this is a plot, we are not supposed to pick on color in the plot. Okay, this is just showing a new angiogenesis ring of fire that we see on our corpus luteum. A ring of fire in a hemorrhage corpus luteum. Okay, and this is our corpus albicans, which appears as a hyperechoic nodule in, a, in an ovary. So this is our corpus. <coughs> so sometimes we can, this can actually, we can actually see this in the next menstrual cycle and it is, no more and it is okay. So let's briefly talk about this process of follicular genesis. And this is um, most importantly uh, of paramount importance if we are dealing with infertility. And I want you to take note now that the diagnostic workup of ovarian cysts that I'm going to give does not apply to cases where we are dealing with um, infertility. Infertility is different altogether. So it, with infertility, we can actually trace uh, which ovary is going, which uh, follicle is going to over ovulate. As I have mentioned earlier, there are some waves which are unovulated and we can actually get an ovulated phases, all of them being an ovulatory and we still get menstruation. Because remember we said in each unovulated phase, there's a gradual increase in FSH. So this can then trigger the normal uterine cycle to take place, but no ovulation is taken place. So you can find the dominant follicles and they are not ovulating. And then you can wonder why this person is not conceiving yet. You can find the dominant follicles at the time that you're expecting to see them. So we can actually distinguish them from a normal follicle, which is going to ovulate. So usually these unovulated follicles have got a thin uh, uh, flaccid wall and it has got an irregular shape. Then we can also use color Doppler to determine whether the follicle is destined to ovulate or not. So on color Doppler, if it's a healthy pre-ovulated follicle, which is going to ovulate, the wall is, we are expecting to see increased vascularity, right? But if it's not going to ovulate, and is destined for atresia. The wall is thin and hyperechoic, but it's, it is a vascular. So when we put on color Doppler, we won't pick on flow on an ovulatory follicle. Then also clinically, when they do the hormonal profile, uh, we expect no more exponential increase in estrogen uh, during the growth of a healthy follicle. Whereas when it's an ovulatory, they tend to produce a minimum amount of estrogen. So estrogen won't rise as expected when we're having in an ovulatory cycle. So this is just an, uh, an ovulatory or atletic follicle, as we have said earlier, uh, the walls are flaccid uh, and it has got an irregular shape. Okay, so just to, uh, look into detail about the vascular flow of those uh, follicles that we said we expect them to ovulate, right? So 
it has been um, different studies you have not, noticed uh, changes uh, on these follicular walls from the onset of at the stage of uh, routinizing women, that is before ovulation. So they have noted that there's increased vascular flow from the base uh, to the apex of the follicular wall. And this increase in flow is also associated with gradual increase in impedance, uh, like there's a uh, reduced resistance to the flow of this blood in the vascular, in the wall of the follicle. So when we sample with our spectral Doppler, we expect to see a waveform which has got high end diastolic flow, indicating a, a low resistance right, to vascular flow. So this is just color Doppler showing the wall of our dominant follicle, which is destined to ovulate. But sometimes it is difficult to pick um, this flow because uh, sometimes these uh, vessels are tortuous. So, due to the physics of Doppler, the ankle, sometimes you cannot pick the color Doppler, but not meaning that the, there is no flow. And as mentioned, when we now sample with our um, pulse wave, we can see that this is uh, a low resistance flow indicating um, we have our high end diastolic flow here where we actually have got an RI of 0.52, then another low end systolic flow here, we've got an RRI of uh, 0.48. So this is a normal follicle which is destined to ovulate. Okay, so let's talk about the big giants in the room that are normally uh, reported as pathological findings when they are just normal physiological processes that are happening in the body uh, in the, um, during the menstrual cycle. So ovarian cyst is one of the most common reported uh, abnormality, or rather a comment that is uh, found in most of these gain exams. And uh, I'm sure most of you have seen a few patients who've come back for follow-up and they will tell you that uh, there was this, an ovarian cyst which was seen on the previous scan and things like that. So, our um, goal today is to avoid these unnecessary follow-ups and unnecessary anxiety to the patient. As you have noticed when we're talking about the physiology of the menstrual cycle, when we're talking about the ovarian cycle, you have actually noted that we expect to see some cysts developing in a normal waking ovary. So yes, we are supposed to see these follicles because these uh, ovaries are functioning well. So just a diagnostic uh, wake up for ovarian cyst. The first step in our diagnostic wake up is we have to determine whether the cyst that we are seeing is it in the ovary or it's non-ovarian, right? Then our second step is, are we able to recognize the ultrasound pattern of this cyst so that we can classify it either as uh, a simple cyst, a hemorrhagic cyst, an endometrioma, a mature cystic, a teratoma or any other cyst that might probably be benign. Then after that, we then classify our patient. Are we dealing with a low risk patient or dealing, dealing with a high risk patient? Then all this is going to determine whether we're going to ignore the cyst that we have uh, found. Are we going to follow it up with ultrasound or uh, do we need further evaluation with MRI or even CGI? So this is just what we've talked about. So classifying these patients now, the low risk and the high risk patients. So the low risk patients are the premenopausal patients and they have no other risk factors. Then on the high risk, we've got the postmenopausal uh, patients and those with other risk factors. For example, they've got a personal history of um, fem uh, breast cancer or ovarian cancer or their careers of BRCA1 or 2 and things like that. So uh, the first ultrasound pattern, which is our simple cyst, how we can confidently say this is a simple cyst is, it is supposed to be unequal with posterior caustic enhancement, and it is supposed to be unilocular. The walls are supposed to be thin and smooth, and we are not uh, supposed to see any solid or wave, uh, wave vascularized components within the cyst. Then that's uh, a, cystic, a simple cyst. 
So this is just a simple diagnostic approach that we can use for simple cyst. And remember, we said we have got our two groups of patients. So for our low risk patients, um, if, it, if we see a simple cyst which is less than three millimeters, okay, something that I forgot to mention when I was talking about this dominant follicle, it approximately grows at a rate of two to three millimeters per day. So when we reach to about uh, to the day of ovulation, it's now about 25 millimeters to 28 millimeters, right? So if we see a simple cyst which is less than three centimeters, do not mention you are done with your scan. You don't need to follow it up because this is just a normal uh, dominant follicle because this ovary is functioning. So you can't report a functioning ovary. It's like uh, you're scanning a patient and you say, oh, your bladder is full. Yes, it's supposed to be full because the kidneys are functioning. So yes, we're supposed to see that simple cyst, uh, which is less than three centimeters because these ovaries are functioning. Okay, then we move on to three to five centimeters now. You can mention it in the report. Uh, then mention that it is almost certainly benign. So there is no need to follow up with this cyst when it's three to five centimeters. When it's now five to seven centimeters, you mentioned it in the report and you also highlight that it is most certainly benign and we can follow it up yearly until it resolves with ultrasound only until it resolves. But if it's now greater than seven centimeters, even if it's a simple cyst who might need to further evaluate it with MRI or even surgery, you will see the image coming up after this where we need to further evaluate a cyst which is greater than centi seven centimeters. And when we're now doing, dealing with our um, high risk patients, remember we said these are the postmenopausal ones and those ones with other risk factors. If it's less than two centimeters, there's no need to mention it and there's no need to follow it up. Then you will notice that for the high risk patients, we're starting yearly follow up from two to seven centimeters, which is different from our low risk uh, patients well, we're following it up from five centimeters. So for our iris patients, we start following it up from two centimeters and do it resolves. But still we mentioned that it is almost certainly benign. And also if it's greater than uh, seven centimeters, we need to further evaluate it with either MRI or surgery. So this was a simple cyst, which was uh, noted in a 16 year old patient and it measures approximately 9.4 centimeters, right? But as you can see, it has got all the features of a simple cyst, the posterior enhancement, thin walls, and then um, uh, it is un unilocular. But then this was proven, surgically proven to be a mucinous cyst adenoma. So that's why we say any cyst that is now greater than seven centimeters we need to further evaluate it either with MRI or you can further evaluate it with surgery. Then we move on to another um, physiological cyst, which is common, which is the um, hemorrhagic cyst. And still we are doing, dealing with our two groups of patients, the high risk and the low risk patients. So in a low risk patient, if it's uh, less than three centimeters, remember we have our corpus luteum from the release of our ovum, uh, so it's probably supposed to be less than three centimeters because we said it is supposed to be less than the size of the cylinder. So if you don't mention it in the report, it is okay. And please note that it is not saying don't mention, but it's, it is saying not mentioning it in the report is okay. So there are instances that you might need to mention it. For example, a patient presents with um, pain which could have been associated to the ovulation. So the reason why you might need to mention it is so that the patient and the doctor knows that, okay, so probably this pain was coming from ovulation so that they don't expose the patient to say the um, um, test, diagnostic tests and things like that. But even if you don't mention it, especially if someone is asymptomatic, it is okay. And there's no need to follow up this kind, this cyst. Then if it's three to five centimeters, uh, you mention it in the report and mention that it's almost certainly benign, but there's also no need to follow it up, right? But if it's now greater than five centimeters, 
um, you can do a six to 12 weekly follow up with ultrasound because usually they resolve after about approximately six to eight weeks. So you should follow it up with ultrasound until until it resolves. And if it's resolved, you are done. But then if it remains unchanged or it increases in size, then you need to further evaluate it with MRI. Then in our um, higher risk patients, uh, we're starting from our cyst, which is less than five centimeters. Any hemorrhagic cyst, which is less than five centimeters uh, in early, early menopause, we can do a weekly follow up, uh, a six to 12 weekly follow up, week follow up with ultrasound until it's resolved. If it doesn't resolve, we recommend MRI. But if it's now in any menopause, because these ovaries are now not as functional as before menopause, so we are not expecting to see an uh, hemorrhagic cyst in um, uh, menopause patients. Uh, we need to further evaluate it with MRI especially if it's now in late menopause, no matter the size of the hemorrhagic cyst that we see, it is suspicious because these ovaries are almost non-functional. So we don't expect to see this hemorrhagic cyst. So if we see any hemorrhagic cyst of any size in late menopause, we might need to consider further evaluation with MRI or even surgery. So the final decision uh, on whether we should ignore the cyst whether we should follow it up or exercise, exercise the cyst is based basically on the morphology of the lesion that has been found on imaging, either ultrasound, CT scan, or MRI. And it is also determined by the risk group. Are we dealing with the low risk group or are we dealing with the high risk patients? And are there any symptoms associated with this lesion or it was just an incidental finding? And if we find any other um, additional findings, for example, arthritis, lymphadenopathy, or peritoneal implants. So this is what is going to determine if, uh, how we are going to deal with this cyst. Then another big giant in the room, which is also uh, most of the time reported is, uh, is uh, pathological when sometimes it is a normal physiological finding is a free fluid in the pelvis, right? Uh, mostly in the POD. So it is possible to see physiological fluid in the POD. And um, we see this during different stages of me uh, menstrual cycle. So when I started this presentation, I said part of history taking, especially when you're doing, dealing with a female patient is you need to know their menstrual cycle, how long it is, uh, in, on which day they are now, so that you can see that you, you know what you're expecting to see when the normal physiological processes are happening. So we can see physiological fluid uh, in the pelvis when we've got our ruptured follicles. So this is during the time of ovulation. So we expect to see some minimal fluid in the pool during ovulation. Then we can also get physiological fluid from retrograde menstruation. So also during the menstrual phase, we can, menstruation phase, we can uh, expect to see a minimal amount of fluid in the POD. And it has been noted that uh, estrogen increases the ovarian uh, permeability. Uh, so this then increases the amount of fluid in the POD during the time of the cycle where our estrogen levels are high, right? This is towards right. Um, so this is just a, an image showing you just a, a small amount of fluid in the um, in the pure D. And uh, judging from this endometrium, this looks like it's shading off. So it's probably during menstruation. So this could be just the retrograde menstruation. So this is physiological fluid, right? There's no need to report this fluid. Or if you report it, just mention that it is a normal physiological finding. But we can also get pathological fluid in the POD, right? We can get it from ruptured ectopic pregnancy in cases of pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, tubal ovarian abscess. It can be pelvic abscess itself or a hematoma. It can be pelvic ascites or after caudosynthesis or in a case of hypertid more. So this amount of this fluid now is different from the physiological fluid. Uh, remember, I said we just expect to see a small amount of fluid if it's physiological. 
So if this fluid is now significant, for example, if you can see this one is, uh, the depth is now approximately 1.7 centimeters. And as you can see, this fluid also have got low level internal echoes. So this is probably not a uh, normal physiological fluid in the pelvis. Then as you can see from this image, the huge amount of fluid to flow level internal echoes probably may be due to the topic or something like that. So just to take a brief look at the literature review, what they say about um, this uh, free fluid in the, in the pelvis. So it has been shown that um, peritoneal flu fluid can indicate an underlying disease process. However, it is the detection of minimal free fluid in a healthy children is not uncommon. So especially in children, for, because it has been noted that uh, these changes in uh, gonadal, gonadal hormones, which include estrogen and progesterone, remember we said estrogen increases ovarian permeability. So because these um, young girls, they've got these hormones which are rising. So we actually expect to see more free fluid in this, these young girls compared to the adult patients due to these changes in uh, gonadal hormones. So they are saying they do not only trigger the appearance of secondary sexual characteristic um, and physical development, but also impact on uh, the overall metastasis of body fluid. So the effect of estrogen on capillary permeability and the existence of residual ovarian exudate in the pelvis uh, of a female patient, right? So. Uh, we've talked about this where well, we've got our increase in uh, estrogen during uh, towards menstruation on our follicular phase. So we expect to see uh, a, a small amount of fluid in the pelvis. So there's, there's a study which was done by Simano Visk et al. in 2011. This they were using ultrasound. And they found out that one millimeter or less of free fluid, intra, of free intraperitoneal fluid detected was probably insignificant, right? Then Tadayon et al. did another study, but this time they were using MRI. So the, you can see that the uh, volume of fluid has increased a bit and they've uh, uh, attributed it to the um, sensitivity of uh, MRI in detecting this uh, free fluid. So they've noted that less than 10 mils of fluid has been assumed normal in all age groups without evidence of underlying disease. So if there is no other underlying disease, if we detect just a small amount of free fluid in the POD, it is probably insignificant and it is probably normal. So in conclusion, there is scanning, scan anxiety, which is the worry and anxiety associated with test and wait for scan results. So just remember that the, this patient that you are dealing with is already anxious. They don't know what is going to come out of this scan results, this ultrasound procedure, what are the results gonna be? So there is already a lot of things which are happening and running through their head, right? So this patient is already afraid, this patient is already anxious. So it is our role and responsibility as sonographers together with doctors, not to raise the anxiety for the normal physiological processes that are happening in the body. Because remember when you tell a patient that you've got a cyst, um, to them, they are laymen, some of them they are laymen. They don't understand what a cyst is. And you know what they will do? They will go on Google and start Googling uh, what is an ovarian cyst? And you know, these days on Google, anyone can just post anything. And then they come across uh, this post where it's written, ovarian cyst can actually lead to infertility or miscarriage, or it can develop into an ovarian cancer. Imagine what is now going through their head. When it was just a 2.5 dominant follicle, which was reported as an ovarian cyst. So let us try by all means not to raise their anxiety for the normal physiological processes that are happening in their body. I thank you.
thank you so much, Miss Temptations Matenga, for this eye-opening, this wonderful uh, presentation. Um, in the meantime, we are going into the question and answer segment. I can see there are three people already with their uh, hands raised. So I'm going to start with Ms. Nchete, followed by Ms. Timulea, then John C. Yanyaka. Yes. Mr. Nchete, you can, you can go on. OK, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you loud and clear. OK, this was a very nice presentation. I like the fact that the title indicated to say uh, it's not always physiologi physiological, or maybe it's not always uh, pathological, it can be physiological. And uh, it's very important as radiographers or sonographers. Uh, I've actually presented such uh, a similar presentation on three, four hours. We need to understand the menstrual cycle, the physiology of the menstrual cycle in order for us to correlate with our findings. And uh, the first things first, we need to know uh, the period uh, of MENAC. A MENAC, this is just a period where, you know, a female at, at what age they start their menstrual and uh, it's actually between eight and 16. So the physiology of the menstrual cycle will depend on the MENAC period. If someone starts their period at eight, at 16, and we note, it's actually noted that, uh, between the age of uh, eight and 16, most of uh, females present with physiological cysts, just like the presenter highlighted. Any cyst which is less than three centimeters, that you don't need to, to worry about that. If, if it goes uh, characteristics of a, a simple cyst, you know, an echoic, uh, smooth walls, you know, just a simple echogenic ring. Uh, I need to touch on something uh, the presenter maybe didn't touch on. Uh, there's also a physiological cyst called uh, Camelus ufras, which presents uh, in the follicular phase and luteal phase. And this one, most of the time, is accompanied with uh, uh, if, if, you, if you do a scan, you see features of uh, something which can relate or maybe features which can point to someone having an ectopic pregnancy because it, uh, this type of a cyst has got those features. It can have one echogenic ring with a double or a sickle uh, echogenic ring. And most of the times, if you take, uh, if you tell this patient to do an HCG hormone, it will come out positive. And uh, sonographers, we need to be very careful about that. I've seen this before. That's the reason why I just wanted to talk about this one. It occurs in uh, follicular or luteal phase. And most of the times, this one you will just measure less than 2, 2.5. So you actually going to find that the HCG hormone will be above 14,000 and it will give you a positive. And if you report such as uh, maybe this is a physiological cyst or this is an ectopic pregnancy, they go and open and they find that it's a cyst. This happened at uh, uh, where I'm working at the hospital. Someone scanned nicely and they saw features of uh, topic pregnancy and they reported. And after that, that's when, uh, you know, we take, uh, we took interest in this case and started looking at it. So it's very important to understand the physiological aspect. And also it's very important to understand the age. Mostly before 16, people will present with simple cyst and actually above 40. Just like the way the presenter said, you know, the low risk and the high risk. So I just thought of highlighting that. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Ms. Tinchete, sorry, I have a question. Can you come again? I didn't quite hear the name of the cyst you were talking about. Okay, it's uh, Kalamas Ufras. It's uh, C-U-M-U-L-U-S, then Ufras. Okay, so how then do you differentiate it between well, differentiate it from, uh, from an atopic pregnancy. Now that you have said even the HCG levels can be as high as, as in the 
happy pregnancy. Yes, I'm about to you... give you a for a, for a pause for. Uh, how do we differentiate this one on scan? That's what you mean? Yeah. Okay, uh, so usually such type of a cyst will present with, uh, you know, sometimes the, uh, the, what's this, the ectopic pregnancy will present with double decidual reaction. We have two echogenic rings, but complete and something inside which can, at now, let's just try to refer to this as maybe a yolk sac or something. But how this one presents, it will present half of it will have maybe two echogenic rings, then half of it will just have one echogenic ring. And there will be something inside which will look like maybe a yolk cyst. So this is how you differentiate it from an ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy will have a complete two echogenic rings. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Malaya. Uh, good evening. I hope you're able to get me. Yes, we can hear you. You can go on. Okay, thank you very much. Oh. Uh, my question is uh, on the follow up. Uh, it was indicated that uh, if you see a specific kind of assist you are supposed to do a follow-up and according to the data that we've been given is yearly you know I'm, I'm trying to figure out on um on those hemorrhagic cysts you do a scan today then you wait for another year uh, on the same time to redo the scan and you expect to uh, maybe reassess a, a similar cyst is it not supposed to be monthly uh follow-ups Oh, okay. For the hemorrhagic cyst, it's not yearly. The simple cyst are the ones that you follow, follow yearly. Uh, that is when, uh, when they are now five, greater than five centimeters. For the hemorrhagic cyst, when they are now greater than five centimeters, you follow them after, after six to 12 months, to 12 weeks, I mean. Why do, are we saying six to 12 weeks? Because usually they regress uh, after about six to eight weeks. So we're expecting that uh, in this period, this cyst is now regre uh, regressing. Remember, the whole point of this is we do not want to want to increase the anxiety of the patient and to do these unnecessary procedures and unnecessary follow-ups of these uh, cysts, which are physiological, which at some point they are just going to regress. That's why we are not following it up monthly. Because it, it might not have regressed, remember, because remember we said it usually regresses after about eight weeks. So the probability of finding it, if we do a monthly follow-up, is this hemorrhagic cyst will still be there. So at least if we give it time and maybe give uh, two to three cycles and follow it up, we expect it to have been resolved. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. John, over to you. Thank you. Mine is more of a comment than a, a question. Uh, firstly, temptation, are you available on this forum to help me come up with protocols in my department? I will tell you why. Normally, I get a conscript, or you call them, we call them comserves, who come over, and they get excited every time they see something like a small cyst, and they want to comment on that. Then I have doctors coming back, wanting to make a follow-up on simple things like a simple cyst. Uh, will you be available? to help us make protocols where we will look at things that need a follow-up and things that, not, that don't need a follow-up unless there is something that comes up later. I'm asking this because, uh, disclaimer, I'm not a qualified sonographer. I'm a diagnostic radiographer who has done short courses in ultrasound. 
but I'm in management, I'm at a management level. So I need to know on the overall what's going on on the ground and what is it that they're doing wrong or what is it they're doing right. So we need to cut down on certain things that they are unnecessarily reporting on that makes doctors refer patients back to us, clogging up the system. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I will try, you can just hit my inbox. I will try to assist. Okay, thank you, Ms. Tisianyaka. Uh, we thank to Mr. Milenga. Before we go back to Mr. Nchet, I see Mr. Nchet's hand uh, is up again. So, Mr. Milenga, Mr. Cuthbert Milenga, over to you. Thank you so much. Temptation for the presentation. That was great. And some few pointers. Mine, it's a, it's a contribution. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as, as people practicing ultrasound, I think we have to take ultrasound to another level so that we can refine our practice in ultrasound. I think that is very important. And then uh, temptation has stressed so much and other previous speakers have also stressed that we need to really refine and do things according to the standards. So I want to emphasize on the point of the endometrial thickness because it's also related with the menstrual phase and what really goes on. So what is important, we also have to understand the thickness for menstrual phase, which would be around one millimeter to four millimeters. Uh, the proliferative phase, which is also called the, it should around be around, make sure it's around the, between four to eight millimeters. Uh, on ultrasound when you measure the endometrial thickness. And then from eight to around 16 millimeters should be the secretory phase. But be careful to mention only two individuals. That is those women that are in the reproductive age and those women that are in menopause, but they are on hormonal replacement. They should have at least endometrial thickness of less or equal to eight millimeters. Then if those patients also who are in the, uh, menopause, but they are not on the hormonal therapy, they need to have at least uh, less or equal to five millimeters of endometrial thickness. Um, and then further, you also have to emphasize uh, and know as, as, as somebody practicing ultrasound that a thickened endometrium in a reproductive age uh, maximum of 20 millimeters endometrial 